Yeah, she told me. I didn't mean to, I meant to get that on there. Tony, we need to pray for him. He's having triple bypass tomorrow. I don't know his last name. No, it's just uh, Lucinda's friend. Okay, pray for Tony with a triple bypass. We'll do that. Hmm? Tomorrow, uh uh-huh. It's kind of, you know, that always is all of a sudden. Anytime that, you know, you hear somebody having triple bypass, that probably means the first of the week they didn't even know they had a problem, you know. It's just that quick. They, they take care of that. Praise the Lord, they do. That's important. All right, if you will, take your Bibles out. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Chapter 8 is such a great chapter because it, it deals with the Corinthian church and uh, Paul's encouragement for them in the area of giving and giving to these... The, it, it, Paul is going around collecting an offering for the church at Jerusalem. The church at Jerusalem is poor. They're having trouble. And this is kind of the mother church, you know. And so uh, he's... Prof- Hello. Uh, so, all right, everybody check your buttons. You think that might be yours? It's gone. Somebody found it. Amen. Okay, we won't tell anybody, Joe, that it was you. Uh, but this is, uh, this is what they're doing, and he's going around collecting these offerings, and he's taking care of things. Well, you know, he sent Titus, and basically we're going to find tonight that Titus kind of encouraged him to let him go to Corinth because uh, Paul's last letter was pretty scathing, and, and he felt like probably he wasn't going to be received well there. And then Titus shows back up and says, No, Paul, they've had revival. And uh, so Paul's excited, and he's writing them now, and he's encouraging them to go ahead and get their offerings ready and get ready to give. And so we're down to verse 16, and here he says, But thanks be to God, which put the same earnest care. Now he's talking about for Titus. He put the same earnest care into the heart of Titus for you. And what he's saying is that Titus cared for you just like I do. He cared for you so much that he wanted to make sure that you were okay and that everything was well there. And so I'm glad, he said, kind of saying, I'm glad that he had that heart. Thanks be to God that Titus had the heart for you. Verse 17, for indeed he accepted the exhortation or the encouragement, but being more forward of his own accord, he went unto you. See, there's where I'm telling you. I think he, he, uh, he, Paul wanted him to go, but then he said, no, I'm going. And uh, he, it was his idea to go and he wanted to go because he loved the church at Corinth and he wanted to make sure that they were okay all right 17 uh uh-huh verse 18 and we have sent with him the brother now this is cool I just got to tell you this is cool Paul never tells us who this is he just calls him the brother I put out beside of him number two Titus was number one, and the brother was number two. But look what he says about him. He said, we sent with him the brother whose praise is in the gospel throughout all the churches. And not that only, but who was also chosen of the churches to travel with us with this grace. This is a neat guy. I wish I knew who it was. But it doesn't matter. I tell you, wouldn't it be great to be known as that guy? I mean, you know, maybe people don't know your name, but they say, wait a minute, I, I've heard about you. You're, you go to Riverside Baptist Church, and you're, you're that guy, you're that lady, you're that one that, you're, you're, you're really, people know about you in the churches, I'm telling you. I don't know what all you do over there, but man, I tell you what, we, we are excited you're here. We're excited you came to be a part of our, our ministry this weekend. I, you know, that kind of thing. Wouldn't that be awesome to be known like that in your church? Amen. <laughs> well, never mind then. <laughs> I just, as I read that, I thought, man, I, I'm, I'm almost glad God didn't tell us who it was. Because now we, get, we don't know, it could have been a Paphroditus, it could have been a Paphros, it could have been, it could have been Silas, it could have been, who knows who it was? It's probably somebody, we don't even have their name written in the scriptures. Because you know what? It didn't matter, does it? It doesn't matter if they're known or not. Paul knows, the churches know, and let me tell you something. They're, he's traveling with Titus because they're collecting this offering, and the churches have asked him to go along with them to kind of oversee 
the gathering up of this money to provide some um, not support um, keep coming you're coming <laughs> financial assistance what confirmation yeah still hadn't hit the word but that's okay you're getting it all of the above all of the above y'all are good I tell you I appreciate it. my front row people y'all are awesome Accountability, thank you. That's what I was looking for. Joni, thank you. Joni gets the gold star. Accountability. Uh, so he, he's, he's there to provide accountability. You're going to see this as we go into the text. But I just love it, the fact that he's this guy, you know? He's the one that was chosen, not just by one church, but the church as. He's known as a man of integrity. He's known as a man of ministry. He's known as a man who loves God with all his heart. That's what we all ought to want to be. We all ought to want to be that kind of person. I think that's just so important. So he says, all right, verse, uh, he's uh, committed to the, praise in the gospel. Praise is in the gospel. He's committed to the gospel. He's probably a soul winner. Throughout all the churches, they know about his zeal. And not only that, who was also chosen by the churches. This would be, a, this would be like a deacon. This would be like a, a man of, a, 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 of high caliber that the church would see and choose to put in this position. I, I just, I can't say enough about him because I just think it's awesome. And then to travel with us with this grace. And when he talks about the grace here, he's talking about the collection. He's talking about the money that's being received. Now remember back in Corinth, who's there? The false apostles. And they're, they're breeding all this garbage about Paul. And they're probably saying, you know, Paul's going around and collect this money. You better find out where it's going. You know, he's probably embezzling. He's probably going to spend the Coke money to buy him a new car. You know, he's probably, he's probably going to be all these dumb things. You know, when you get to money, churches go nuts, don't they? Oh, it's like, oh, man, you preach the gospel, hey, that's okay, but don't you miss spending that money, you know? Good night. Okay, I'm going to go on. I'm not hitting home with you. I'm not resonating or something. Look at this, verse 21. Here is, here's his job, providing for honest things. Providing for honest things. Providing that accountability not only in the sight of the Lord, that's enough, you know. If you're in the ministry, you don't mishandle funds. Because if you do, you know God knows. Nobody else may know, but God knows. And you can't, you, you, you can't live with yourself if you try to misuse some of God's funds. I'm telling you, that's the worst thing in the world. So he says, not just in the sight of the Lord, but also also in the sight of men like i said it's one of those things that uh, in church i'm going to just say it again because i think y'all need to hear it i think every church needs to hear this church people get more concerned about the budget than they do about their soul winning or about winning people to christ or whether the word of god is preached they're more concerned about making sure the money's spent in the right place and nobody misspent it you know and I appreciate our budget committee. I know that they have a ton of questions. They question everything, and that's fine. That's what their job is. But you know what? We ought to trust those we put in position to take care of the funds and then don't worry about it, you know? And I, I, I just think we have to... If you ever are in that position where, you know, you're looking over the financial report and you're thinking, I wonder why preachers got this money for something. I wonder why he got that. Is he used it? I wonder what he used it for. I wonder if he misused that. I wonder, listen, I'm going to tell you this. You don't have to worry about this preacher ever misusing money. And number two, I don't have any clue about what's going on with the money. If you come up and ask me, what's our budget? I don't have a clue. I don't have a clue. I do not know. I don't know what our, what our overall budget is. It could be 100000 It could be 200000 I don't know. It doesn't matter. Don't tell me because I don't want to know. <laughs> That's bad. Our treasurer doesn't even know. So well, there we go. But you know what? I don't know what you give. I don't, there's not a person in this, this church, I know what you give. Whether you give regularly or not, I don't have a clue. I, I know what I give. And that's all, I, that's all I'm concerned about. I take care of that. You take care of yours, I'll take care of mine. How about that? Sound like a good deal? But God knows, amen? So uh, if you think you're getting by, you're not. God knows. But I don't have to know. God knows. And God takes care of that. I come in and I Monday on Tuesday mornings I usually come in and on the tote board 
uh, Faye will put up what our offering was. And I'll come in and say, man, we had a good offering. And I go to my office. Or I might come in and say, that was a terrible offering. I go to my office. <laughs> because it's Faye's problem now. I don't have to worry about it. <laughs> She's got to find the money. I don't have to. But, uh, you know, it's important that you understand that about your preacher. You need to know that. I, I, ah, uh, well. As church members, if money ever becomes a problem, hear what I'm saying. It shouldn't be a problem. You've got, in our church, you have, you have a budget committee, you have a treasurer, and you have a, a, a church council that looks over that every month, and uh, you don't have to worry. It's taken care of. You are welcome to ask questions, but don't ask me. That's the worst thing to do. If you have a biblical question, I'm the guy. You have a financial question, she's the girl, amen? <laughs> or the budget committee. That's the, way, that's the way it should be, amen? You know, so many pastors, they spend more time working on the budget than they do on their sermons. It's sad. I, I can tell you that's the truth. I, I talk to them, I know. And uh, they're, they, they can tell you to the penny where their budget is and what they're doing here and who gives and who doesn't give. I was with a pastor one time, and I said, yeah, you have a, a member coming to my church. I said, I just want to let you know about it. He said, well, you know, they're giving. It kind of went bad. They didn't, in fact, you know what? They didn't even give the last three weeks they were here. How does he know that? I thought, how does he know that? I just thought, well, I'm glad I don't know. I don't want to know because I'd either love you too much or I'd be mad at you all the time. So I don't, I don't want to be either. I just want to be. I want to be the builder rotor guy. Okay, enough of that. Providing honest things in the sight of the Lord, in the sight of men. That's important for us as a church to do that too, that we take care of our, our finances the way we're supposed to. And I, I want to say that about that as well. We're responsible. God gives us something to use. We need to use it the way God wants us to. Let me just say this while I'm already on that. God didn't give us money to sit on it and hoard it. That's just... God gives you for it to use. And we need to make sure that we're using it properly. Some churches, they get a little money in the bank and all of a sudden they don't want to spend it. That's terrible. You know what? The, you read the story about the, uh, the, the talents, the parable of the talents, and you find that what is, what the man gave them so much and they came back and what they had used it for something. But when he came to the one who buried it, who put it in the bank and didn't even draw interest on it, he called him a slothful servant. He said, that's the, the least you could have done was put it in the bank and let it draw interest. That's the least you can do with what I've given you. John Morgan told me that, pastor at Sagemont Baptist Church. He told me that. He said, isn't that a shame? He said, that's what most churches do. They put it in the bank, let it draw interest. Right now, what's it drawing? About 1.5% or 1.25%. You know, it's really making a lot of money. And then what's it been used for? Is it used for missions? Is it used for the church? Is it used to reach people? Is it re No, it's sitting in the bank. Somebody else is using it to build a house or buy a car, and we, we're putting it over there for We need to make sure that we use what we've gotten. There's nothing wrong with saving money, just like we've saved for buildings, and we have something that's planned for. There's nothing wrong with that. But just to sit on money, just to sit on money, no way. That shouldn't happen. All right, enough of that. Let's go on. Uh, verse 22, and we have sent with them our brother, that's Titus and number two, whom we have oftentimes proved diligent in many things. He's talking about number two again. You get that? He said we proved him diligent in many things, but now much more diligent upon the great confidence which I have in you. He said we, we, we have confidence in number two because he's coming to you and, and we're so glad because we know you're going to give better than any other church. You're going you're gonna to pour out these blessings of gifts on them and it's going to be awesome. But he's the guy for the job because he's been diligent at it and we have great confidence in your diligence and what you're going to do. Verse 23, whether any do inquire of Titus, I like that, in case you're not asking about Titus, just... You know, I've talked about number two a lot, but let me just say this about Titus, Paul says. He's my partner and fellow helper concerning you. That's a great position to be in. I love being a second man. I love being associate pastor. I love being the pastor's go-to guy. I love that job. It was wonderful. 
uh, and you have to have people like that you can depend upon to get things done, to get things happening. I, I'll share one with you. This is cool. Uh, you know, my bathroom broke down. We had, uh, when the guys were working on the building, they, they flipped a switch and we burned up a motor and the heater in the baptistry. And I had forgot about it, and Ron Davis asked if they could borrow the baptistry for a baptism. I said, sure. I came up, filled it up, got it all ready, turned the baptistry heater on, let the pump run overnight, but I forgot to turn it off. Well, when you do that, it gets like, it gets like crawfish cooking hot. And so, man, that afternoon I called Ron. I said, Ron, I'm so sorry. I bet that water was just scorching. He said, no, Brother Jim, it was freezing. I had forgot. The heater had gotten burned up. The pump had got burned up. So there was nothing but cold water up there. And this was like in November or something. Uh, so I've been, wait, I've been trying to get this thing fixed. And I've been trying to, and I've got a reason for telling you this. This talks about when you find people that can do things, you let them do it, you know? And uh, I've been calling plumbers, and I've been calling different people, and uh, I finally, I called this one plumber, and he showed up, and we walked around there, and he looked at it, and he said, Brother Newton, he said, I wouldn't touch that with a 10-foot pole. He said, I, if I get involved with that, I'm going to tear that baptistry up. I owe you a baptistry. Of that. I, I can't do that. And I said, oh, okay, forget it. So now I'm thinking, I'm going to have to get somebody that knows how to do fiberglass work. So I'm thinking, who does boat work? You know, I'm thinking, <laughs> I need somebody to do, because it, when we tear this apart, it's going to have to be fixed, and they're going to have to re glass the baptistry. And I'm thinking, money, money, money. Man, it's bleeding money at this point. So finally, I got to looking at it, and I thought, you know what? Maybe we ought to just take it apart, and we'll see what's going on. So I called David, our, our maintenance guy, the guy that takes care of things around here, and I said, David, let's look at that thing and see what we can do. And David got in there and got to looking at it. And we decided, let's take it apart. So he showed up one morning, and, and Jim Thomas was out there, and I was going to help him. Jim said, I'll help him. I said, hallelujah. So they went on back there, and I mean, within about 15 minutes, they come out and said, you won't believe that thing just fell apart. Broken? No, no, it fell apart. It's, it's we're easy to fix now. I said, hallelujah. So this afternoon, or this morning, they got back there, and they got the heater hooked up. They did it, and it's, it's beautiful. I mean, it's perfectly done. It's like a professional plumber had done it. I mean, they did a great job. You know what it cost us? Nothing. Nothing. They're volunteers. <laughs> They're church members, you know. Yeah, you church members, you're volunteers. You don't, you don't charge. Uh, anyway, <laughs> so they got, well, it did cost something. We had to buy a heater, and we had to buy a pump, and we had to buy some fittings, but they... They took care of it, and, and I was so proud of them. They just did such a great job. But here's, pastors have to have people like that. Paul had to have somebody like that. He needed a Titus, a fellow helper. He needed somebody like that. We all need somebody like that, somebody to jump in and give us a help. And he says, our, our brother, again, no, excuse me, he says, our brethren, our brethren, now then he's, it's more than just one, now there's more because brethren is plural, so there's two, maybe two more, I don't know, more than just the one brother number two, but now it's our brethren be inquired of, they are the messengers of the church, so he said, you may ask about Titus, well, this is who Titus is, and our brethren, that's number two, and these other guys that are traveling with him, they're messengers of the church, church as, and the glory of Christ. Let's just say this about messengers of the church as, not just the church. You know, the church as, the churches of the biblical time saw their connection to each other. They weren't fighting for each other's members. They saw the need for each other to be involved in each other's lives, to come together for things, to work together, to get things done. That's the hardest thing in the world to find in churches today. Our Kent Revival is one of those situations. I get asked all the time, how did you get those churches to participate like that? I ask them. I don't know. I just ask. And they wanted to. But I, they, I, I get called by the convention and different ones, and they're saying, how did you get churches to, to work together like that? They all talk about it, but none of them do it. It's like, you know, they put out a, we're going to do this. Of course, usually what they're going to do. Hey, our church is having a super meeting over at our church on Sunday night, and we want you, your church to come over and help us and be a part of that, which sounds great, but most churches, pastors are looking at that and say, yeah, you want me to come over there and build your attendance. And so you don't go. 
So you know why you know what you know why we have it up on the hill up here? We could have it out here in our yard. You know why I have it up here? So it's yeah, it's 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 common ground. We had I'm way offline, but y'all just stay with me. This is cool stuff. We had one year, remember we couldn't put the tent up? And we had it here at the church. Poorest attendance we ever had. It was literally terrible. Because why? Because they were having to come to a church, somebody's church. As long as we're up on the hill, they show up. Put it in a church, they don't show up. Yeah, that's the reason we go to the fire station for the extravaganza. We could have that over here in our yard, but we don't. In fact, they put Riverside Baptist Church out here on the sign. I would rather they not do that. We always keep our name out of it. Our, our pastors that are at the, uh, the, church, the uh, tent revival, uh, none of the material is ever say Riverside Baptist Church or Jim Newton on it. Never. Never. And I tell them, this is not about us. This is not about your church. This is about Jesus. That's it. And they know you don't get up and advertise about your church unless you've asked, basically, you know, because we just don't do that. This is about Jesus and him only, and we try to make sure we stay with that. Uh, we'll every once in a while say something, but normally this is it's centered just on that. We don't make it about the church or a church. And many times they will want to try to acknowledge me in some way. We appreciate Brother Jim for putting this together. I, I, man, I tell them don't do that. Because I don't want that to happen. I don't want us to have our name there. I want it to be. I want it to be about God. I want it to be about Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So I hope you get that. All right. Where am I? All right. Let's go back. Verse uh, twenty-four. Wherefore? Oh, I like this. Wherefore? Show you to them and before the churches the proof of your love and of our boasting on your behalf. You, you get what he's saying to Corinth. Okay, Corinthian church, open up, give as a witness to the other churches and proof of your love so that all our boasting about your giving is true. That's what he said. Now, he's, he's bragged on the Macedonian church, but evidently he's done some bragging on the Corinthian church that they were going to be givers and they had prepared the year ahead. They were planning to give and He'd told all that, and now he says, you guys, listen, follow through. If you promise to do something, do it. Come on. Don't just say you're going to be a witness for Christ if you're not going to be a witness for Christ. And he says, be a witness for Christ by doing what you said you're going to do. And he encourages them to that. And I think that's the, the sincerity of their love. He challenges them for their sincerity of their love. Verse 9, chapter 9, verse 1. For as touching the ministering to the saints taking care of others. This isn't uh, about taking care of pastors. This is about taking care of the church, taking care of people. It's superfluous, superfluous, super... superfluous. Superfluous. It's a redneck way. It's what it says. Did anybody know what that word means? I didn't either. What? Super flourish. <laughs> what does it mean? Yeah, it means unnecessarily. I don't need to mention this. It's not like I need to mention it. So y'all take that word, memorize it, and make sure you use it in a sentence this week, okay? Put it in your word bank. But it means unnecessary. It is unnecessary for me to write to you for I know the forwardness, I know the willingness of your mind that you want to help, for which I boast of you to them of Macedonia. So Paul, I, this is one of those places where I think Paul's kind of charging the pump a little bit. You know, he's kind of, I, I, he's, he's boasting about them, he's building them up because he wants to make sure they give the way they're supposed to. He's, he's kind of laying some groundwork there and He's giving them this and kind of boasting about them and telling the, this. And he said that a KI was ready a year ago. A KI is the, the area, it could be like the county, uh, the province, the Roman province from which uh, Corinth is in, uh, the city of Corinth. And so this is the surrounding areas. And so he says, uh, he said a year ago, uh, you had this idea, you were, you were going to give. You had you'd planned to do it. You'd started raising the funds. And your zeal hath provoked 
very many. He said, I've used you as a testimony, a witness of how you were going to gather it up and you were going to give. And because of that, many of the churches have been giving and it's wonderful. And so understand, you have been a witness from what you were going to do a year ago. Yet have I sent the brethren, that's Titus and brother number two and some other brothers, lest our boasting of you should be in vain in this behalf. That as I said, you may be ready. So he says, I, he says basically this, he said, now I knew a year ago you were ready to do this. He said, now that I'm sending the brothers to collect that money that you were gathering up a year ago, and don't let me down now. I've been boasting about you. Don't let them get there and you not have it ready. You, you make sure you've got it ready. Prepare that offering so that it'll be ready when they come. Verse 4, Lest haply if they of Macedonia come with me and find you unprepared, we that we, we that we say not ye should be ashamed in this same confident boasting. Now, it's kind of interesting. His wording there is a little crazy for me. But he says, he says we're going to come. I'm telling you we're coming. You know we're coming. Make sure you've got your offering all gathered up. Make sure it's ready so that when we come, in case some of the folks from Macedonia where I've been bragging about you, you're giving, if they come and you don't have it ready, it's going to really look bad, not only for you, but for us. Because we've been boasting about you. We've been talking about you. And so uh, make sure you've got that ready to give. That's important. Now, let me ask you something. What do you think would be your response? Don't answer. I, let me just share with you. What do you think your response would be? Here's this guy that you've had people telling you, hey, you better be careful giving to his ministry because he, he, he kind of misuses it some places. I, I think you might want to be careful about giving that to him. And he writes you a letter and says, hey, I'm sending some guys to pick up the offering that you're supposed to have been collecting for over a year now. I want you to have it ready. You might be a little offended by that. You might be a little careful or cautious about that. I don't think Corinth was. I think they understood the importance of it. And I think that's what Paul is sharing with them. It's important that you be this witness. You're the church. You're the Corinthian church. You're the big church. You're the guys that are looked at as having all the gifts. You're the ones that have all the things going on. So don't let us down. Make sure you're ready. Verse 6. But this I say. No, oh, no, no, no. Not verse 6. Verse 5. Therefore I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren, Titus, the two, and the others, that they would go before unto you and make up beforehand your bounty. So he says, I'm going to send them, not just to collect, I'm going to send them a little further ahead, just in case the Macedonians come with me, they'll already have it, they're going to come in there and they're going to go around and collect the offerings and get it ready, okay? So that's what they're going to do. Where, whereof ye had noticed before that the same might be ready as a matter of bounty and not as of covetousness, that you gave it, out of, the, out, of the, out of the want to, out of the desire, out of your bounty. You just gave the way you did, not out of covetousness, meaning that Macedonian people show up and they see you going around going, yeah, they're Titus and them guys, they cleaned me out. Man, I tell you, they came by the house and cleaned me out, done in me for that money we were supposed to give last year. I can't believe they did that. We go, I don't want that going on. Gave out of your bounty. Gave out of all the... You think of the bounty that you have in God. You know that you don't own anything that God doesn't give you? Not a thing. You're sitting there thinking, well, wait a minute. I work for my money. Well, let's see. Who gives you the breath? Who gives you the brain power? Who gives you the strength? Who gives you? God does. God didn't write me a check. Oh, yes, he did. He gave you the ability to work and think. Everything you have is God's. If you haven't learned that, you need to learn that tonight. Everything you have is God's. And when we have the opportunity to, to demonstrate our love for him, for what he's done for us, it ought, to be, it ought to be out of our bounty, out of all that we have. I, I don't know if you feel like I do, but I'm the most blessed man in the world. I don't have a lot of money, but I sure am blessed. I am blessed, 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 blessed. Man, oh man, if you read my Facebook thing this week, I was sitting there, i tell you what happened. You want to know what happened? I had called my son Monday morning. Ben had done a D-now down at down in Santa Fe with some young people, and I wanted to see how it went. And he and I got to visit him. He got to tell me what he taught from the Bible. And so I shared with him what I taught on Sunday services. 
And we shared back and forth that. And when I hung up, I thought, how many men get to do that with their sons? And I thought, man, I'm blessed. And then I got to think about my daughters. I said, man, I'm blessed. And I got to think about my sweet wife. I am doubly blessed. And I got to think about our church. I got to think about our grandchildren. And there was, no, there was nothing that I could think of where I could say I wasn't blessed. And that's why I, I say this. I am, and I don't, I don't say it as a brag. I, don't say, I just say it as a praise. I, am, I believe I'm the most blessed man on this planet. I believe that with all my heart. I do. You know, well, you don't even drive a new car. That doesn't mean you're blessed. <laughs> that means you're in debt. That's what that means. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah. Wow. And pay $7. Pay seven dollars for gasoline, a gallon of gasoline, and four hundred thousand dollars for a shack to live in, and yeah. And where did you come from? Yeah, see, that's what I'm saying. Where'd you come? Texas. No, I don't. I'm just saying you left there to get to Texas, amen. Yeah. $60 Phillips Civic. Yeah, I saw somebody Facebook said, I, 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 filled up my, I filled up my tank for $20. It was, it was my mower, but it filled it up. <laughs> okay, we've gotten off subject. I, you know, that's a good question. Does, he, does Paul sound worried here? I think he just wants to be sure you know, he's, he's heard from Titus that there's been revival there. And I think he's excited about that. I think that he understands that if there really has been revival, there really is going to be a good offering, which means Jerusalem's going to be taken care of, and that's his heart, you know. He wants to be able to take that back. So I, I think that's more, more in line. I, I don't, but he sure is trying to make sure everything's taken care of. So it could be, could be. That's a good question. Let me just, I want to finish with this, verse 6, and I'll stop with this. You've heard this before, but this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap sparingly, and he that soweth bountifully shall reap bountifully. In fact, it goes on to say, whatsoever man re sows, that shall he reap. But let me just say this, that passage is dealing about giving financially. We use it for a lot of other things, but you, if you want to pull it out of context, that's fine. But I'm just going to tell you, in context, Paul is saying, he that gives, sows sparingly, you, you give a little, you're going to get a little. You give more, you get more. You get a lot, you get a lot. Now, it's not reason to give, I'll tell you that. You need to give because you love God. But understand this. So many people want to just be chinchy with God. It don't work. It just doesn't work. Because uh, God's not chinchy with you. Woo! Glory to God, he's not chinchy with you. All right. I'm going to stop there at verse 6. The choir is going to work tonight to finish up their uh, practice for the cantata. And uh, they were, usually they meet during Bible study time when this happens. And they asked me about it tonight, Jim. And I said, well, Jim said, y'all are ready. You just need a little once over. And they started hackling. Like, are you kidding? And so uh, we're going to be working tonight for a little while on the uh, cantata. And y'all pray for us as we come Sunday. Bring somebody with you. The greatest thing you can do is bring somebody with you. Find somebody that doesn't go to church or bring them. Or somebody that maybe goes to church and they don't have early service, bring them to early service. Say, come and hear my choir sing, you know. And uh, I think you'll be blessed by it. All right, don't forget the activity Saturday. Amen? Everybody ready for that? Yes. Amen. Thank you. And uh, then Sunday, all the activity Sunday, so don't forget all that, okay? And we're going to have a great Easter weekend. Yes. Yeah, nothing. That's right. They get to take that with them, don't they? Amen. That's good. All right. Let's stand and be dismissed with a word of prayer. Thank you for being here. I hope it's been a blessing to you. 
and uh, you learned something tonight. Good crowd. Thank y'all for coming. Y'all make preacher feel good when you show up. Not that that's why you come, but it does make me feel good. Father, we thank you for this evening. We thank you, Father, for the Word of God and how it speaks to us. Thank you, God, that we can enjoy being together. We can laugh. We can cut up. We can share things, Lord. And we know, Father, in the end, we've learned something. And tonight, Lord, we've learned what it is to be a servant. We've learned what it is to be a witness. We've learned what it is to be a giver. And, Father, I pray that as we leave tonight, we'll take those things that you've given us and apply them to our lives. We love you and thank you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.